We're at the closing lunch and learn for the Loa Spiritual Family Exhibition. If you missed it, you get the opportunity to hear from a few people, including the curator, Gaston Aishian. The exhibit comes down today, but if you hurry, you can come over and get to see some of the items that are still up. These masks come straight from Haiti and they are for sale. They're huge, beautiful. The artistry will have you stepping back. <laughs> they really look like metal, but they're paper mache. discussion that was taking place on the opening night. It was crucial for everyone in the place to really, not necessarily to see the work, but understand what was taking place behind that work, and being able to listen to the Hugans and the Mambos and the priestesses to talk about the connection with their Nifa, their dual movement, their education movement, and the culture and see how we're all really never and connected together. Uh, I was thankful to have Columbia to open up for us as far as with the performance and it was, there were three questions that were being asked all of the, the, the panelists. And it was amazing how just within those three questions, it took all night. Mm -hmm. And everybody was able to answer. Mm -hmm. And it was to a point where individuals came in thinking they were going to spend like maybe 15 minutes. And ended up staying 15 minutes after closing. Mm -hmm. And didn't even want to be um, I would say that this project has been something I've started thinking about at least three or four years ago. Uh, sat down and met with Linda, with Monique, with George, with this, with Fred, as far as just trying to figure out how to make this happen. And it was to a point where, at some point, I, I was about to push it back again, because when you're working on something that you're passionate about, and things are not going the way you want it, you keep pushing it back, keep pushing it back. And it got to a point where once the date was secured, Everybody I got that tapped on the show to be a part of this project had no question that I wanted to really just come on board immediately to be able to help put this together. Uh, the idea might have been something that was bestowed upon me, but putting this together was just not something I did myself. It was, I mean, just being able to, for one, attending some of the ceremonies. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the greatest things that I was say, the greatest honors that I was able to receive within that is when I, I was asking Kalinda, uh, when I was taking photos of the ceremony at the Prince of Vines uh, house, how I interacted with everybody who was there as far as practitioners doing the ceremony. 
And it is crucial to be respectful when doing that. But she said it was almost like I wasn't there. Uh, and being able to be mindful of the situation, whether it's um, the Haitian movement, whether it's Ifa. And a lot of times individuals, in, especially when we have so many different ceremonies and situations that take place, people are always right in front of you with the camera. Uh, sometimes you see flash and they're, they're really drunk so when I heard all types of uh, uh, disrespect that was had taken place as far as being people crossing through when the drums were being blessed and not understanding there were boundaries and being able to respect that. And it worked to me, everyone who was involved in this project, the artists, they, it's something that they understand, something that they live in. It was important for me to have them a part of that. And I think, actually, I, I know I'm a little longer than in the introduction, but I wanted to make sure to point out that some of those factors. foresight and courage to, um, to, to put together a project that has to do with this particular spiritual subject um, is needed and I hope that we can continue working. Um, I also thank Ashe for being, um, again, courageous to host something of this caliber as well because not everyone in the community in the nation and the world embrace um, African spirituality and African-based spirituality. So um, it's almost kind of revolutionary in a way to even present it. But as the moderator, I really wanted to just be as simple as possible but as open as possible as well so that everyone would have an opportunity to answer the question or feel inspired to answer the question. And so I thought um, hard about what those three questions should be. And as you said, um, it did give everybody the opportunity to speak about their own personal practices, um, their own hairstyles. And I just feel like the whole night was just Phenomenal. It felt like, you know, the word that's being floated around now is fellowship. Not just for the artists and the panelists, but the people who were in the room. You could feel some kind of synergy with, with all of us being open to, to what we were saying and really listening to what each of us were saying, even though we had varying degrees of understanding about what this topic is. And, and so... I felt appreciative to be a part of it as a moderator and also to, to have a few of my pieces that um, in my own artistic practice connect to Haiti. So um, I'm Ruth Gwendolyn Laveau, but um, Gasson called me uh, during a time where I was already uh, in preparation for my Voodoo Conjure Fest and this being the fourth year. And actually, on the Friday night that this was going to happen, I already had another event planned. But when he said what he had planned to do, I had to, I had to find a way to clear the schedule, change things around, because I had to be a part of this. And so the more we began to talk, I said, well, hey, would it be OK if I did include this event in the Voodoo Conjure Fest? And that way we can advertise mm -hmm. each other. So this was so perfect, and this was exactly something that I wanted to include, something I wanted to be a part of, because the whole purpose of the festival, as with this event, is that we need to begin to narrate our own stories. Mm -hmm. People need to hear the truth about these traditions from us, the practitioners, not always an outside observer, not always somebody who is coming from you know, the point of view of just anthropology, but not actually being in the culture. 
So here in New Orleans, or in Louisiana in general, we have our own unique form of voodoo. But this was a chance for us to get together Haitian voodoo, African voodoo, uh, New Orleans or Louisiana voodoo, and then we could talk about what is similar, what is different, what are the stories of those particular lineages, what are the specific experiences that you would have in each type of ceremony, how does that fit into the context of that particular culture and that community. So I felt like this is such an important event Voodoo is something that is utilized in the tourist industry mm. um, as a part of this whole banner of black culture that's used to draw people in the city. And so often we don't really get credit for that. Everything that makes New Orleans unique is us. Mm. You know, it's, you know, you, you come, you're eating African food. You, this is African spirituality. You're listening to African music when you interface with us when you get to the city. But all too often, the story, the narration is being told by somebody else. And oftentimes, we don't get to tell it the way that we experience it. So the more events that we have like this, the better. And I really enjoyed being a part of this because not only are we seeing you know, images from different ceremonies where interfacing with each other, we're talking to each other about what it is that we do, what we have in common. You know, I think this is a very important thing that I hope we will continue to do. This started off as a learning project thinking about the Haitian Revolution. And throughout my research, the more I started diving into the, the revolution, uh, I started looking up certain individuals and their characteristics and what they did. And the more I learned about certain individuals, say for example, um, this African, and Toya, um, their personalities really started to showcase some of the loas, the principles of voodoo. Mm -hmm. And that to me was extremely intriguing how you could read so much about the Haitian history as far as, okay, you, you see the battle, you see all these individuals get got together. They did the Bois Cailloux ceremony, but people didn't really think about what it took to put that ceremony together. You're talking about enslaved individuals on the island being able to coordinate. It took almost probably four years to coordinate, go from plantation to plantation, talking to Huga, talking to different individuals, to say this is the night that we're all gonna meet, and we're gonna have this round table discussion, and we're also gonna have Bukman, also a Huga, and you're gonna have um, so uh, all this, and it, it, even though, for one, people think Wakayama, which is the most known, but there are other ceremonies that took place in the island for that night to say that we are going to stop this. This is no longer something that we're going to embrace. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, really became chilling to me as far as just being able to be connected to that, that lineage, and also how great that was to be able to use and embrace those principles and those individuals. Um, a great individual is Toussaint Louverture. Um, to me, his spirit was known, I would say, like a leg mm -hmm. One who opens the way, one who starts and being able to allow others to cross and come through there. He never made it to see the independence, but he opened the door for them. And then he let this out lady, the next in charge, to be able to make sure that he had the ogle, the um, spirit to say, okay, I am going to be that force to make sure this is happening. So just looking at the, each individual as far as their characteristics, seeing how the Buddha was really put together and then being able to embrace that, but also seeing how their counterpart balanced them out. Mm -hmm. um, when you have this Aline, you have his wife who was one who was very peaceful. She also, was, she, she, never, she didn't believe in battles, but she believed in helping those, that that was her role. And he was more of the force. So it's like the yin and yang that balance within those forces and being able to come together. So to me, that project, this project, 
really started off just looking into the revolution and then really thinking about how individuals embrace that. And then also seeing the science behind it. Um, so it's, it's so easy to, to look at the serpent and the rainbow or mm -hmm. Halloween and mm -hmm. so many other factors that really gloss over this and not seeing how so many individuals, whether you are a Freemason, whether that, how there's a lot of components that are still connected together. So this project to me, this is the first exhibit and just sitting down talking to um, uh, Huva Fafa, um, Mambo Mari Kamel, um, Kalinda, and just everybody giving me the support to say that this needs to continue. This is something that I look forward to really doing every year. Um, given that support and given that understanding, and for me to also have a better understanding and education of my history of Ruby in, in, in a way that it should be told. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to um, also reiterate the, the power behind beginning to understand the history of the Haitian Revolution, which is what also drew me in. Um, I've been traveling to Haiti since 2008 every year, and one of the first draws was first the rhythms, you know, the rhythms in, 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 uh, in the dance, you know, that, that, that is, seems to be one of the lines that just takes the spirit in. But then when you start to get, get further inside of understanding the history and culture of Haiti, it's life changing. It is literally life changing because it, it opens your eyes to the understanding that some of the history that you have been taught may not be so. And some of the history that you are not taught, you begin to learn and you put two and two together and you realize that I have some work to do. And so um, one of the one of the elements in the historical record that drew me was Cecile Fatima. She was alongside Brooklyn Duty for the Voodoo ceremony in Boakaiame, and that drew me so strong. I went to Boakaiame. I went to the Citadel and Sans Souci in the north of Haiti, and it's some powerful history. And understanding that we, as people who are from New Orleans and Louisiana, are connected to this history, and that we're not taught this history, it is beyond empowering. It, it's enlightening. Mm -hmm. It sets fire underneath you, in your heart, in your spirit. And you start wanting to really understand things that, hey, what they told us is negative, dark, and evil may be actually the opposite. Okay? And so then you start to try to learn more. That's a good point. Um, bringing up uh, the Haitian Revolution. What people, what we need to begin to understand that so much about voodoo in this, what we call the new world, is revolutionary. And that, number one, that begins to color what we know about our history. So when we think about not only the Haitian Revolution, but some of the lesser known uh, battles that we had, there were uh, slave revolts in Appaloosas mm -hmm. in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Also, when we look at the force that was behind Nat Turner, we have our spirits behind us. And so then we can start to understand why it was so necessary for someone trying to oppress us to taint that image and say that voodoo was evil. Mm -hmm. What you see in voodoo you're seeing resistance, you're seeing revolution. Unity. The, and you're seeing a lot of relics and objects that really speak to protection, that speak to the fight. Not necessarily this idea of cursing or hexing or doing evil, but no, if we are our own army, if we are the only people that will protect us, mm -hmm. if we are the only doctors that will heal us, then we have to do that. We have to be that medicine, we have to be that protection. So you can understand if someone doesn't want you to know your identity, they don't want you to feel your self-worth. If they don't want you to even have the sense to stand up against a force that's oppressing you, yeah, they would consider this science, this religion, this spirituality that they don't understand evil. And then they want to turn you against that so that you never are able to tap into your personal power, the power of your ancestors, the power of your spiritual traditions to rise up. 
Yes. Reverse psychology is an amazing phenomenon. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Open floor, so any questions? I think what's always interesting about, um, you know, when you talk about Haiti, is the relationship between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, how it's one out of two worlds. Um, I mean, I know for those who traveled over there, you experienced just, even crossing the board, I was um, with, a, with a brother brother of mine who was, you know, dark skin, I'm light skin. When we crossed the border, they asked him for his passport and, and all this kind of stuff. And like, we're just trying to go to the marketplace, you know, but it was a big thing. So when you talk about, you know, that relationship, how does that take part in your work? Are you sure that colorism and those things come up for you? It, it goes back to me to embracing who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and I said it because even there is a riff, uh, it's called between, it's one island. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost, the island before, even Haiti before Columbus stumbled upon it, it was always Haiti. Right. It was never Hispaniola. Mm -hmm. So whenever people say um, Hispaniola, or now known as, it was always known as Haiti. Um, but when you hate yourself so much, or have when somebody puts that on you, so I mean, and we all have mm -hmm. that grew up. I know as far as just looking at yourself, you maybe always pick apart something that you don't like. But when you hate yourself so much that you will abuse someone else to make yourself feel better, or when you hate someone else more, then that makes you feel better about yourself. But it's not going to change the fact that you need to work on yourself. And to me, that's on both, as far as both individuals. I mean, just like for me, just learning about, or I still, I'm an infant when it comes to Pokemon. I grew up around it. Uh, when it comes to medicine, when it comes to people coming over, the drumming, the rituals, it was always there. It was never really explained, but it was something that was always around me. But the more I start to learn, the more I start to sit down with individuals, the more I'm seeing the power that it brings. And I think once, I'm just thinking about a conversation I had a friend of, with a friend of mine uh, regarding even Haiti, as far as people say Haiti is, is, is lost, or we are lost people trying, when I'm gonna get to that, that level of independence and freedom, it's, to me it's almost like you have to go back to what sparked that revolution and embrace that. And then once you are able to embrace and know who you are, I think that's when that balance comes into play. I think as long as there's something going on within the public, within Haiti, within the people, like even now, I mean, there's always been uh, work to to kill, the, uh, as far as kill the uh, Waikai, the tree, Waikai. Uh, people wanted to desecrate almost every area that had anything to do with the revolution, which was linked to voodoo because of the Catholic Church and other individuals. And we have to really just get back to what we were and, and embrace that. I think that's where that peace and that love is going to come. Otherwise, it's going to be a continuous rift within oneself and the country. Yeah, there was an article I read where they were saying uh, they made a deal with Satan. You know, that's what that's what sparked the revolution. Who wrote the article? Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, uh -huh. That sounds very much like what they said about Robert Johnson's song back in mm -hmm. the uh, Crossroads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they said, you know, he made a deal with the devil. He paid uh, the devil, you know, two, three dollars. And what the, who they were really talking about was Papa Legba. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a deal with the devil. He was asking Papa Legba to open the door. Mm -hmm. You know, so they will always take what we have because it's not understood and then change it around to mean something else to keep us out of our own source of power and you know knowledge and our ancestry. But let's be clear. Yes, it may be said that they don't understand, but to a degree they do understand that it is powerful. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that it is- And the need to suppress it, it. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, you go back to the black codes, the Cold War, 16, uh, 1615, 1685, and Louisiana, 1724, they, meaning those who were in power, um, instituted laws against the congregation of Africans. And those laws were instituted for a purpose. Mm -hmm. It was to keep Africans from organizing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just about singing and dancing in Congo Square. Mm -hmm. They understood that if Africans came together, that they would then organize how to escape the state system. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I had a question. Very simple from the statement that you mentioned earlier. 
question is to you and I, so you mentioned what is New Orleans food mm -hmm. from your perspective as practice? And the same thing to you guys, so what is Haitian food in its practice? Okay, so voodoo, when we go back and we look at Africa, you have the Fon and you have the Eme. And so New Orleans, Haitian voodoo comes more from the Fon, New Orleans voodoo or Louisiana voodoo comes more from the Eve. Still very closely connected, still a lot of the same influences. But when the Eve came here, it became New Orleans voodoo. So then that was mixed with everything we had going on here. So we still had a lot of the same influences. We still have French. We still had the indigenous that were here. We still had, even with the Eve, we had Congo, we had Igbo, we had Fon, we had Bambara, we had a lot of different other nations too. And so then the voodoo that happened here had to speak to the specific conditions that were going on here. You know, how we were being oppressed here. What are the remedies? What types of illnesses do we have here? What are those remedies? What plants do we have available here? And then when you go to Haiti, they have their specific story of, you know, what were their conditions? What were, what were they allowed to do in the open? What were we allowed to do in the open? So their voodoo had to then become tailor-made and Gasson can share, you know. It, it, it's really the same what you mentioned, and everything is gonna be based on where you are and what you need. Okay. Uh, and just like, in even the low ones, there was, we have the from Dawi, they had the, the base of the foundation, but then Haiti had the new ones based on the needs of people at that time, and in Haiti. Um, so in every place, whether you're in Cuba, whether you're in Brazil, everybody has a potential for what the people need there at the time and beyond. So just like um, in Christianity, you have Protestants, you have Baptists, you have Jehovah's Witnesses. There's, there's that foundation, and things branch out based on what people are seeking. Now does New Orleans voodoo have the you know the, the, uh, the purple, I've heard folks talk about the links to Catholicism and how we you know you know you know New Orleans you gonna get some Catholic somewhere along the line but what are those relationships? So every Catholicism. Uh, Catholicism. Okay. So uh, New Orleans, like other places where we would see Santeria, we would see Haitian voodoo. Um, every one of us were forced to be Catholic right. at a certain point. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we had to hide our spirits behind the images of the saints so it was never really a situation of us specifically seeking out to exchange voodoo for catholicism right but we had to have a way to practice it so as to where we couldn't necessarily have our voodoo altars and have our statues of the way that we want to or show we had to to create this imagery mm -hmm. so you know you see you know uh the Virgin Mary, you know, she might be Ezuli, she might be Mami Wata. We know that, right, right. but they didn't necessarily know that. And so some families retain those names all the way down the line, even until today. Some families, because there was a point in history where you could be in trouble or maybe even killed for practicing voodoo, some people chose not to pass those spiritual names down to their children. So then it just became, okay, well, uh, Virgin Mary, you know, or yeah, it became that because they didn't want to pass that down because if you think you're in a situation, you don't want to put your children in jeopardy. Right, right, so you right. think, you know, much the same way, uh, even with, uh, I can tell you with my grandparents, um, they were whipped in school for speaking Creole. So they didn't teach my parents how to speak Creole. I mean, they know some things, mm -hmm. but they didn't teach them how to speak it because it was seen as, okay, well, English is the better way. That's a new way, and you want to give your children something that's better. Yeah. So that's the same thing with uh, voodoo and that relationship to Catholicism. having a component of that included somehow, or even a component or some statement, if it's just a statement, it may not be any kind of imagery, but um, but included, as well as the 1811 revolt, because the research by, um, in the 1811 book, talks about one particular song that we know came from Haiti, 
but it was also signed here, and it said that it was signed in that 1811 revolt, but it uh, was in the book that I found it, which is a book from Haiti, Haitian culture, history of Haiti, it was about a voodoo priest, and it was sung from uh, or around an initiation, somehow it came out of an initiation, it was sung during an initiation. So there are some definite connections between uh, Louisiana and songs and um, revolution. And then my question is your ability to go in and, ph and photograph ceremonies. How were you allowed to do that? Was it before, after the ceremony? Was it then, during the ceremony? Um, was it because you were the, you were the photographer? Could anybody else just go in and, and photograph this? So can you speak to your ability to go in and make these images? I would say the ability comes from building relationships, knowing the Hugans and Mambos, speaking to them first, uh, and talking to everybody. Now, I may document everything, but I don't show it. Um, certain things are not to be seen unless you're there. Uh, and I'm still learning some protocols. There are certain things, things like, say, for example, um, when some when the spirits um, ride something or embrace, there are certain things that are too, so sacred that it, it's really not to be documented or, or photographed. And I've been in places with um, Fafa where he would actually tell our people to cut their camera off and allow me to, to document it. Same thing with Kalinda. Uh, and all for one, they understand that I have respect for the ceremony. I understand where to stand. I try to be out the way, and most people don't. And being respectful is definitely very crucial, and a lot of people are not. And I want to say, when Garçon is photographing the ceremony, you forget he's there. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had the conversation ahead of time. You know he's there, but once ceremony happens, you know your mind, your attention goes to other places. You you don't see him. You don't see a flash. You don't see him until it's done and you have these beautiful pictures but not too many people can do that and not too many people even understand the reasons why they should do that a lot of times you know a photographer first of all a flash will totally break anything that's happening you know if, if uh, someone was getting ready to go into trance that will snap you right out of it so Gasson understands how to do that without interrupting without getting right in front of you you know so that's a, a unique quality, and people are usually not allowed in to photograph those moments, but um, he can. just having my own different spiritual practices that included ancestral worship, um, different tools of how I started studying herbs and plants for my own healing tools and my own self, um, and going further into it, studying my dreams, certain studying certain images that I've seen throughout my own practices, and coming in and researching it and finding these types of things, and then reading further and being like, oh wait, back up. So there's all these different sectors. So you have the Iwe, the Loa, the Orishas, all of these different things, and that you're supposed to be called to it, or, or you know, or I don't know that, but I'm saying <laughs> what I found just looking up what I started finding naturally, going in and kind of taking interest to see what is this, how does this work, what is what is really going on, and kind of finding that there's a strict initiation process. Um, that goes forth when trying to, I guess, seek um, these types of things. Like, can you shed some light onto how that works or your own um, findings if you're not necessarily like born into a situation where you're taught these things naturally or there that you were uh, had these not this knowledge already readily available to you? So, when it comes to initiation, uh, traditionally this would have been family. You know, if we still had everything intact, you know, you would trust the person initiating you just like you would trust your grandparent and your parent because it would have been your own parents. So even when you look in the modern day house, it's still the structure of the family. So going through initiation, either one is going to come from a certain family line,
the the spirit realm, whether it be the dreams, whether it be through trancing, spirit possession, there's a lot that you can interact with. Some things you should, some things you shouldn't. So whenever you go through initiation, this streamlines that focus so that you are interfacing with the right spiritual forces and not everything that there is out there. This is how we prevent mental illness. And this is how we prevent uh, other types of uh, confusion and deviance by being able to streamline that process. So then you're connecting with the spirits that are most benevolent to you in the most effective way. So what you would do is, you know, divination is always the first step. So whoever you go to, they would divine for you and they should tell you if you belong there with them or not. Maybe your, your path is somewhere else. If they're ethical, they will tell you that your path is somewhere else if that's the case. Uh, and then you would see if this is the right timing. What should be done when? Maybe something should be done now and then something should be done when a person is older, a little further down the line. Or maybe this is the preparation up to it. But everybody's path is unique. Everybody's path is different. Some people were initiated when they were children. Some people may not be have their first initiation until they're 60. It just depends on the person, your soul's purpose, your path, what you came to do. So when you seek that, you're really stepping into a family and this path is specific to you. You know, you can't compare it to somebody else's experience or think, okay, well I read in the book, this is supposed to happen, that's supposed to happen and I'm supposed to get this next because it might be very different and sometimes we don't always know why. Um, where we are in our path, we, we may not be able to ourselves think about 20 years down the line. But then in retrospect, you find out, you see exactly why everything had to happen in the way that it did or the order that it did. Because initiation is also going to take into account the other actions or the other things that are going to happen within your life. You know, there might be certain births, certain deaths. There might be certain situations that happen. And that information that you receive through divination takes all of that into account. I am from Morocco and I've been to a lot of voodoo uh, ceremonies and service. I understand what it is and I also have a business at the French market where I sell voodoo t-shirts and customers are always ask me what's the big deal about voodoo in New Orleans? Mm -hmm. So I really never have an answer for them. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that my, my answer is always because uh, Marie Lavou came here mm -hmm. and I really I don't have an answer that with this. You can help me, but I can yeah. tell because you know to understand myself, what made New Orleans you know big in voodoo. Okay, so Marie Laveau is probably the most well-known uh, figure of yes. New Orleans voodoo. However, Marie Laveau was one person who carried that. There were other people who carried the same thing, but we don't know about them. Uh, necessarily in their specific stories because they weren't necessarily documented in newspapers or uh, other publications. So the big deal about it, um, it was the spiritual system that we came here as enslaved Africans. We brought that tradition here with us. Um, now, why it's a big deal to us and why it's a big deal to tourism might be two different things. Yeah. For us, it's a part of everything that we do. So you can't really separate voodoo from who we are as a people, even if we ourselves don't know so much about it at this point. Maybe we decided to you know, continue on in the church or maybe we decided to embrace Islam, whatever. It's a part of everything that we do. So the way that we play our music, there was no such thing as us disconnecting culture from voodoo, the way that we do our art, um, the ceremonies that we have. We can go back and we can look at the bead work that we see when we look at the black Indian tradition. We can look at how we do our second lines. Why do we have this celebratory act right after a funeral? All of those things are connected to voodoo. So for a long time, we disassociate ourselves from that word. And we've been taught that that word is evil and that it means something else. But really, everything that we are is this. It's a part of it. We, we just don't stripped. say the, the, we the word. And before we disassociate it, we stripped into assimilation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then out of that, you once you align yourself with something that is other than what you were, mm -hmm. then, and you embrace it, mm -hmm. then you begin to find 
disassociation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it being so big with tourism, which is the voodoo that they're, they feel that they're experiencing, that's really just the tourist form. It's not the real form. So the reason why that's so, such a big deal to them, because it's something that has been able to be exploited, you know, commercialized. And so it can go right along with the narrative of curses, hexes, oh, witches, vampires, you know, and all of this, this mysticism and this scariness that the city is supposed to be about. The cities of the dead, they're haunted. This building is haunted. Not really trying to understand the spiritual science of it all, but taking it and making it fanatical and making it something that can be, you know, sold and commercialized. So that's the reason why it's a big deal here because it's something that, you know, from the tourist aspect, it's never really understood. It's not even understood by the people who put out this propaganda. Yeah. So it can just be this big mystery that's in the air that they can do anything that they want. Now, why it's important to us is it because it's everything that we are and everything that we have to offer in the city through our talents, through our gifts, is voodoo. Whether we know to say that or not, it is that. Mm. And some would say that it's not even a, a, a practice, it's a way of life. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's Absolutely. a way of life. Yeah. 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 It's not something you practice. So, Buddha, yeah. I would say to break it down simply, it's about building good character. Um, it's about building good character. And in order to build good character, there are laws, there are laws, there are principles to follow. Mm -hmm. Being able to embody each one of those to make you a productive member of society. To be able to really help you to really have to find that balance within your community. Um, and, but within all that, there's a lot of principles to learn, to understand as you grow, as you learn. But a lot, when people think of the witchcraft, it's not, not Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not the movies. <laughs> Don't worry about it. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's really, if you think about the principles, you it will help you to build a character. That's it. Gaston, what, what can you tell us about the ceremon ceremonial masks that came directly from Haiti? Oh, the, um, the paper mache masks are, well, before I even talk about it, I want to make sure to acknowledge all the other artists who are not here as well. Like the paper mache masks were uh, created specifically for this exhibit, and they are for sale, by the way. So please purchase and support the artists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, DJ Seville. Um, DJ Seville is a phenomenal paper mache artist out of uh, Jacques Mel Haiti. And he, uh, without hesitation, when I called him, uh, contacted him as far as letting know what I was doing, wouldn't know how many masks I wanted. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he had created each one based on this exhibit, uh, which will also be uh, on view a little longer on the, at the main eye shade, mm -hmm. uh, or anyone interested in looking at it. But he create, he's one of the lead paper mache artists in Jacques Mel Hill. He creates a lot of phenomenal work for some of the carnivals. Um, he's been here for uh, Jazz Fest 2011 when they highlighted Haiti. And within the mask, uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out, because a lot of times people see the mask, they see the horns. And one of the things that I wanted to, to be noted within those horns are to showcase how they really embody the, the enraged slaves driven to fight for freedom against his oppressors. So that's why sometimes they're scared, but they're really bold and they're very strong. Um, and it's just one of those things that he was able to create to be able to, to bounce within this exhibit to showcase that part of the voodoo as far as the paper machine mask themselves. Uh, and another artist who is not here, let me see, make sure. Um, and DJ Seville's Jacques Mel Haiti. You have behind us on this wall right here is Zakaria King. She is a phenomenal photographer. Of course, she was not here for the opening. Um, she's actually in Miami currently. And she's been documenting Buddha ceremonies for some years now. And she was able to provide her pieces um, to be included in this work. 
the other artist is from Miami, Florida. Uh, Who's led Jens Ford? He is, his work is right behind us. And he's been documenting a lot of uh, voodoo ceremonies in Miami. He's also been to Cuba with um, a dance troupe to, to document some of the uh, spiritual practices in Cuba as well as in Miami. And he's been really working together. And that's one thing I want to point out is all of the artists, to me, I specifically chose them not because they take great photos or do good work, but because of their passion for voodoo. Mm -hmm. and the African spirituality, I wanted to include their work within that because they had a sensitivity to the subject matter uh, that was important to showcase. Um, you could, there are so many individuals who have work, uh, iron work, uh, paintings, sculptures, but it was important to know that the artists, the works that you see are within that community, and it was important for me to showcase that. And one of yours uh, over here where Folk are in some ceremony. I don't know where it is, but it's uh, okay, Kalinda. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> this is an initiation ceremony uh, between uh, me and uh, Voodoo Chief Divine Prince. Uh, it was at uh, the House of the Divine Prince, and right there we are in a salute before we begin ceremony. We salute the ancestors. So we're in front of the altars, the specific rhythms are being played, and we're in a salute. And so we touch the ground when we do our salutes because that's where, when we think about the ancestors, we see them as in the earth, and beneath the earth, when you go further down, you have the deep waters. And we could also say that's the astral plane. So whenever we go and we connect with our ancestors, whether it be through dream or whether it be through trance, we're touching that astral realm, we're touching those waters where we feel that the ancestors are. So we always, we're very um, cognitive to touch the ground and to, to go to the ground. And so it's not really that same sense of, you know, everything divine is high and then everything bad is low. Divinity is all throughout. And so that's a part of our salute. Yes. <laughs> yes. Then my question is, what was your interpretation of what was happening? Well, when I was a kid, I grew up in Baptist uh, churches. When I was a kid and folk used to catch the Holy Ghost, as we said, we thought it was a, a, a show. We thought they were doing it for attention. We didn't understand uh, what was really going on. And the thing that really convinced me was uh, one woman who was parallel to the floor and she jumped over her body, jumped over the back of the, the pew into the next aisle and that's just not humanly possible. <laughs> I, you know, that, that did it for me. I was convinced that it was, no, it was not a show. Something was going on. I didn't understand what was going on but you know, I knew something was. Seen it, but witnessed it many times. For me personally, I get scared. Knowing what it is, and it's just a spiritual thing that it's gonna go because, like I said, I've been to ceremonies and also witnessed my family member. As a matter of fact, this the month of June, my niece who was sitting down, and we had a problem, and we were talking about the problem, and we do some uh, incense burning and things, and she stopped burping, and we knew right there when she stopped burping she was getting a spiritual in her and she started talking in another voice and telling us what's going on. I get personally scared by my family sits with her and ask a question and want to know the answer for what we were looking for. But personally, I just get scared. <laughs> get so out. She, she was reaching back to, there was a, a someone older and wiser with certain knowledge, yeah. probably an ancestor coming back to give the family the, the answer. So. At one point, we would have all been very comfortable yes. with that because we would be accustomed to having that. That would be an acceptable part yeah. of our culture. So yeah. whether, you know, 
somebody's catching the Holy Ghost in church or there's a spirit possession in a voodoo or ifa ceremony or even uh, situations where there's a misa blanca or white table or sometimes whenever you put on that Indian suit and begin to change, you begin to transform. This is just, you know, that's, a, that's the purpose of the mass to begin with, to have that ancestral spirit come through. So when we have that experience, what's happening is that personality is moving aside your personality and then that spirit comes in and is able to communicate with the community so it it looks sometimes it may look a little you know for instance let's say i'm possessed possessed by a spirit that is bigger than me stronger than me and you used to seeing me uh move around the way i move around all of a sudden i you know, I start affirming these these strong characteristics. That's going to look very weird in my body if you don't know what you're looking at. But if you know what you're looking at, most people in ceremony would say, oh, well, that's not even her. They don't even pay attention yeah, yeah, yeah. to the fact that it's me that this is happening to because they understand they're communicating with that specific spirit. And they know that those gestures are characteristic of that spirit. So it's just the fact that we're no longer accustomed, you know, largely to being in the presence of someone in spirit, except for maybe in church. And then even when you see it in church, a lot of times you find that the older people are more okay with it, they feel comfortable with it. And maybe some of the younger people, you know, children even would be like, oh, I don't know, what's, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what that is, <laughs> you know? So it's just, uh, it's just us kind of being reintroduced to it. I won't even call them exhibitions, I call them experiences, because every time you come through, um, I think everybody learns a little bit more about their own history and culture and heritage. Of course, Monique, you know, you are a member of this family. Monique come through and, and teach us all, all kind of stuff, all the time. And, and Mama Kalinda, you know, you are always welcome. We, we don't see you enough, uh, but you are, you are, but we are, we know that, um, you know, your knowledge and your, your, um, your visceral wisdom that, that always comes out each time I see you speak. Is, uh, is always apparent that we appreciate each and every one of you uh, offering your time uh, and talents to the uh, Ashe Cultural Love Center. And, um, you know, we should do this again. The lunch and Learn. So, folks out there, Facebook land, Lunch and Learn, we thank y'all so much. Let's go, these people go eat too. <laughs>